Right, so welcome everybody to today's live session. I hope you can hear me clearly and if you can, if you could just indicate in the text chat area by typing in Y. Um, great, thanks Irene. Okay, excellent. Great, thank you very much. So welcome to everybody here today, uh, which is actually, as Jakob mentioned, this is the first in a series of Emerge Africa webinars where we will be looking into the current status of how African higher education institutions are making use of MOOCs. The next one is actually happening in two days time, which will be on Thursday. So you're welcome to join us again for the next session. So today's uh, webinar is titled Postgraduate Students Experiences of Wrapped MOOCs at a University in South Africa. And our presenters today are Shanali Governor and Tasneem Jaffa. Now Shanali is a lecturer within the Staff Development Unit at SILT and SILT is the Center for Innovation in Learning and Teaching at the University of Cape Town. Although Shanali's teaching experience began in secondary education, a return to higher education to pursue her own studies prompted a shift to an interest in the higher education landscape. She has worked in varying capacities in three South African institutions of higher education and has strong interests in the scholarship of learning and teaching. Her particular belief in the staff development team is to support part-time and non-permanent teaching staff. She is responsible for running the SEA Teach, which is Supporting Emerging Academics Teach Program and works within departments and faculties on request. While continuing to work in the field of staff development at UCT, she is also working towards her PhD, looking at discourses in the learning experiences of first-year engineering students. Now, Tasneem also works at SALT, so she is a colleague, and is a digital learning materials designer for the MOOCs team. She loves anything to do with learning and information and has a strong interest in MOOCs, which she believes has formed the perfect foundation for her job as a learning designer. She also believes that it's a really exciting field and is happy to be a part of the SILT MOOC journey. She is really interested in learning the workings of designing blended and online courses and as a serial MOOC taker, she is excited to experience the behind the scenes aspect of creating a MOOC. She is also currently completing her Master's in Educational Technology, where her research topic focuses on students' perceptions of wrapped MOOCs at UCT. She has also worked in the field of user experience, which is UX, and has an undergraduate degree in Information Systems, which has had a strong impact on her analyst and technical background. As you can see, both very busy and accomplished ladies we have with us here today. So we are extremely fortunate and thankful to both Shanali and Tasneem for setting aside time to speak to us today. So I would like to hand over to Shanali now uh, as she takes us through the postgraduate students' experiences of wrapped MOOCs. Thanks, and over to you, Shanali. Hi, Tess. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for the yeses. Um, thank you very much, Catherine, for the introduction. Um, I'm sitting in my office uh, with Tasneem. Tasneem is going to be mostly responding to people on the, um, on the chat function, and I'm going to do quite a lot of the actual presenting. Um, so thank you very much to everybody for being here today. Um, I want to say up front that this presentation is largely based on Tasneem's work um, for towards her masters. Um, and so it is very much her work and I'm presenting this time to give her a bit of a break. Um, so what I'm going to ask people to do is, and, and I'm fairly sure that most people in the room are fairly confident and comfortable with this, um, I'd like you to just, in the chat space, just very quickly 
type out some of your ideas of what MOOCs mean to you. So we all know that there are massive open online courses, but what do you associate with MOOCs? So just into the little chat space on your screen, very quickly, one or two sentences, what do you associate or believe to be true about MOOCs? Okay, so from Catherine, I see that there's the idea that sometimes MOOCs can be self-pacing. Um, and that's absolutely true. Some MOOCs are self-paced. Others, however, are very much um, uh, like a face-to-face -face course uh, where you start at a certain date and end at a certain date. Um, Judith's pointing out that there's a very wide range of topics. Yes, um, everything from personal happiness and what to feed your child to quantum physics. Uh, yes, MOOCs give us the, one of the opportunity is an opportunity to reach a wider audience. Um, maybe not without restrictions, but without the kinds of restrictions that face-to-face -face organizations um, impose. Yep. Um, yes, with MOOCs, you are the only person who cares if you complete. Um, there isn't someone necessarily chasing you to complete. There is an opportunity to interact with um, many more learners, so learners from across the globe who come from different parts of the world than you. Mm -hmm. Nicola pointed out that these are large online classrooms, often very American perspectives. Uh, depending on where the MOOC comes from, indeed, all MOOCs come from a particular perspective. Many MOOCs are based out of the United States, so yes, lots of American perspectives. Um, Tony is highlighting the student choice element. So you decide what you want to learn, how much you want to learn, when you want to start, when you want to stop, and so on. Yeah, um, I think if you work in in the not it, sort of if you work in the global south, there's definitely an opportunity to get a bit more material out there. Um, so Ruth is pointing out that perhaps MOOCs are not very good ways to make a return on investment. If they aren't supported, there's limited value, okay. Okay, I'm going to please feel free to keep typing because I think everyone's ideas are really interesting and very important. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to pop up some of the ideas that we have about MOOCs from the literature. So to a large extent, MOOCs are associated with very large course sign-ups. Um, this isn't always the case. It depends very much on the MOOC in question. Generally, there are no formal prerequisites or admission requirements. Um, and they are also associated with that there are fairly low completion rates. There's usually no institutional accreditation with MOOCs and very little or no cost for enrollment or participation with some small cost, relatively small cost for certification. Okay? So I think that we're probably all on the same page in terms of what a MOOC is and how it functions. Um, can I just see by show of hands, can I, or not by show of hands actually, can I ask you to just type in um, have you done a MOOC, and if so, how many of them? So just like yes and a number. Cool. There are some definitely some MOOC <laughs> some MOOC addicts in the room. Lots of people. So I think Sally's comment, lots of us start mini MOOCs or register for mini MOOCs, but we don't finish them fully, or we may finish a selection of them. Uh, definitely MOOCaholics, I like that phrase. So given the, given the, the, the access to MOOCs that many of us have uh, available to us, one of the things that we have to think about is what happens when we combine MOOCs with a face-to-face -face environment. Um, and that's what today's presentation really looks at, is how, how do MOOCs and the face-to-face -face environment interact. <coughs> On the screen in front of you, what we try to do is we try to represent 
what the existing learning landscape looks like. So the image in front of you has got the idea that there is an online space and there's a face-to-face -face space and that that kind of shifts from the formal where there's some type of accreditation to the semi-formal, uh, perhaps short courses and so on with some kind of certification rather than a formal uh, full qualification and then through non-formal learning spaces. And what we're really interested in is how MOOCs fit into that, how they get used in those different spaces and how they may be changing some of the learning that is happening in those spaces. So the term that gets thrown around a lot in relation to this is the idea of wrapped MOOCs. And there's quite a debate, an ongoing debate in the literature in terms of what is a wrapped MOOC and what can you call a wrapped MOOC. And when Chasim was working on her thesis, one of the things that she did was that she had a little bit of a think about what people actually meant when they said wrapped MOOC. Is it just a MOOC that is in some way incorporated into or part of or associated with a face-to-face -face space? And one of the things that was quite clear was that there wasn't a great deal of clarity on what a wrapped MOOC was. And so what we did was we focused on three questions to help us understand what we meant when we were talking about a wrapped MOOC. The first question was we asked whether or not there was an institution or organization that was either hosting or supporting the face-to-face -face element of the learning experience. So is there some organization that's part of the process of wrapping this MOOC? If there's an organization, then what kind of organization is that? Is it um, a regulated educational institution? Or is it some kind of um, professional body, employer, non-governmental organization? And then finally, if it is um, a regulated educational institution, is the MOOC incorporated into the formal academic curriculum or the co-curricular activities of the institution? And what we did based on those three questions was we came up with four categories of wrapped MOOC. Um, and hopefully what you can see on the screen in front of you is a visual representation of those four categories. So if we take that MOOCs are any situation where you have a massive open online course interacting or intersecting with some kind of face-to-face -face, um, context, and then you apply each of the questions, and the questions are in like a little thought bubble. Um, based on your answers, you can decide what kind of wrapped MOOC that is. Um, so if, for example, you have a wrapped MOOC where an institution is involved, and you ask what kind of institution, and you say, OK, it's a regulated educational institution, such as a university, then you might ask, is it for formal credit, in which case you're dealing with a formal wrap. If, on the other hand, someone says, no, it's not for formal credit, then it might be some kind of co-curricular wrap. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause on the screen for a moment, and I'm going to ask everyone in the room to have a little bit of a think about, in their experience of wrapped MOOCs, what kind of wrap is most common in their context? Um, I'm going to keep talking a little bit because I want to explain some of those terms a bit more. In the literature, there are MOOCs that have a face-to-face -face component or where MOOC takers incorporate a face-to-face -face component, but there's no formal institution involved. And we've decided to call that a peer wrap. So this would be a group of people who get together weekly without any kind of institutional umbrella or support for it and who just get together and work through some of their experiences on the online course. Um, also in the literature, there are a group of um, studies that report on what we're calling non-formal wraps. So that would be where some kind of professional body or NGO very often um, provides a little bit of support around the MOOC itself. Um, there are cases, for, for example, related to healthcare in Rwanda and so on. Um, the most common, we think, is actually the co-curricular wrap, which is where there is some kind of regulated educational institution 
no formal credit is necessarily given for the MOOC, but it is um, supported through the institution in some kind of way. Um, and formal wraps are also being seen more and more. I'm just going to look a little bit at the chat quickly um, and see what people are saying there. So Karen says she's had an experience of co-curricular MOOCs, and she's going to tell us a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, Judith is talking about co-curricular wraps in their, their department, but not a lot. So the particular study that we're going to talk about a little bit more after this is a is a general institutional case of co-curricular wraps. Um, Catherine, will you tell us a little bit more about what you are thinking about in terms of your experiences of a co-curricular wrap? Right, so Karen says the type of mood she's interacted with had linked organized by formal institutions, but they were not for formal credits because it's not a degree or diploma. Okay. Um, Right. Okay, so this particular piece of research is associated with, um, is what we're thinking of as a kind of co-curricular wrap. And I'm going to encourage folks to just keep making some notes about what kinds of wrapped work they think is happening at their universities. So this study was carried out at ECT, which is a which describes itself typically as a research intensive university. The study focuses um, largely on postgraduate students' experiences of wrapped MOOCs. Um, and one of the things that's quite useful to know is that the UCT postgraduate student group is largely drawn from outside of UCT. So it's a very, very diverse group. Um, we draw students from all over South Africa into our postgrad programs and all over the rest of Africa as well. Um, we also have a fairly substantial um, American and European um, cohort of students or group of students in postgraduate at UCT. So it's a very, very diverse group with very diverse um, educational histories. The Office of Postgraduate Studies at UCT is focused on supporting postgraduates and completing their studies. And they identified a series of problems in that postgraduates are very diverse in their levels of preparedness for postgraduate study. Um, this is by no means simply a UCT problem. And there are a couple of studies um, on your screen that reflect that. It's also um, postgraduate students at UCT are also incredibly diverse in their attainment of graduate attributes by the end of a program. So, and once again, this is by no means a local problem. Um, it's very much an international problem as well. And there are a couple of studies um, that reflect that, or a number of studies that reflect that. We've just chosen two. The postgraduate, um, the Office of Postgraduate Studies then went on to identify MOOCs as a possible site for learning. So they thought that given the fact that MOOCs exist and they're out there and they're on this incredibly wide diversity of topics, it would be possible for students to do some self-study or some group study using MOOCs in order to both improve their levels of preparedness for specific activities. So for example, we had students um, doing stats MOOCs or um, learning about uh, writing through MOOCs and so on in order to raise their levels of preparedness um, or adding value to um, their qualification by learning, for example, to code in Python um, as a way of supplementing what it is that they're studying in class. However, MOOCs are associated, as we're all very aware, with um, a very, very high attrition rate, with a very uh, substantial dropout rate. And so the Postgraduate Center decided to offer the idea of a wrapped MOOC with a local facilitator in a small group of students um, where the facilitators were really there to support students and to encourage them and keep them as part of the process um, and to try to try and address the idea of the attrition. So this particular piece of research took a qualitative case study approach um, and Tassim collected a very, very wide range of um, primary and secondary data um, across a sample of students. So she did a number of student and facilitator interviews. Um, a number of student experience surveys, and then she had all of the evaluation data from the courses themselves. 
And once you gather that, she opted to use um, Garrison, Anderson, and Archer's Community of Inquiry framework um, in order to look at what were the different presences um, that were at play in terms of supporting student learning. So in terms of the wrapped MOOCs then, what did we learn in terms of how students experienced the RAP MOOC process. In the first instance, it was unequivocal across the data that students found having some kind of um, authoritative figure important to their learning. What was quite interesting and a little bit unexpected was that to a large extent, the face-to-face -face instructor replaced the online MOOC instructor. So a lot, of, um, a lot of students reported that the MOOCs became less and less important to them um, and that they came to physical sessions, face-to-face -face sessions, rather than engaging with MOOC material online. Um, and this was reported both by students themselves but also by facilitators. So people said things like um, students only came to the facilitated sessions and did little, if anything, of the online work. And they reported not watching the MOOC videos, but asking the facilitators to identify what was important. Another key thing that the facilitators did was that they provided context. A lot of the MOOCs that students were engaged with were very, very general. So MOOCs around writing, MOOCs around argumentation, MOOCs around statistical analysis, um, and so on. And those were quite difficult for students to find a way into. Um, and so students really enjoyed finding practical local applications um, and having um, facilitators able to help them to relate to the course, uh, relate the course to their own research and background. The other thing that was fairly clear that came through from a number of facilitators was that facilitators try to create a kind of flattened classroom space. So many of the facilitators were first and foremost themselves MOOC participants. So they were engaging with MOOC material as it became live, as it became accessible to them. Um, and that produced a kind of flattened classroom structure where the facilitator wasn't seeking to, um, to occupy a kind of position of disciplinary authority. But what was quite interesting was that even though these were postgraduate students, they came expecting that traditional authority. And they really looked for that and wanted it. And in fact, people said that they were um, quite at sea with all the equalness. The facilitators are also at UCT are often postgraduate students themselves. So they really wanted to create a kind of comfortable, collegial, peer-based environment. Um, but there was quite a bit of tension there around still needing to kind of create a little bit of hierarchy um, or a little bit of distance in order to ensure that learning activities still happened and that students were supported in terms of um, answering questions and engaging with material. Facilitators also had quite a substantial role in terms of clarifying MOOC content, sometimes because of the geographical distance, sometimes because of language issues. Um, students struggled to engage directly with the content, and facilitators were able to provide either local concepts or clearer versions of the concepts that students could really relate to. And finally, facilitators really provided um, a central link to foster both the social and cognitive preferences. So it was an opportunity for um, facilitators to support the kind of social learning of the group. Um, and to create the conditions in which students could engage in individual learning as well. Through creating practical learning activities, through creating spaces in the face-to-face -face, um, context for students really to engage with uh, the material that was being shared with them online. OK, I'm going to pause there for a moment and just look at some of the conversation that's happened in the chat. Um, so I'm seeing comments around I'm looking at Karen's comment, if some of the more general tasks like supporting student learning, orientation, etc., can be done by facilitators through a MOOC, there are human resource savings. Um, 
I'm not sure necessarily that there are as many human resource savings around that in our context um, as there can be in others. Um, certainly, certainly the MOOCs created a kind of material springboard for people to work from. Um, but at the same time, the face-to-face -face space with the actual present facilitator was the thing that students were most drawn to. Um, yeah, I think Catherine's point that, this, that participants definitely preferred live engagement. There was something about um, they felt like they could create trust more in the kind of face-to-face um, -face space than they could online. But that's also a matter, I think, to some extent of uh, experience. And as, as people become more experienced with learning in online spaces, their capacity to manage those increases. Okay, the second finding that was, was really crystal clear was that in addition to really liking having a facilitator, a presence facilitator, um, people also really like real people. Um, and by real people, we mean people with faces and bodies and voices that you can see and meet on a week-to-week -week basis. So our postgraduate students expressed a very strong preference for face-to-face -face interaction. Um, they liked that they were able to ask questions and interact with other students with the same queries, um, which wasn't always possible in an online course. Very often in the kind of large online spaces, people couldn't connect with the people who had the same difficulties or same challenges as them. Um, they kind of got lost or swallowed up in those spaces. Um, and for some reason, our students reported feeling that the discussions were more real than in the online space. And I think that that relates to that issue of trust, that in the online space, maybe people are a little bit more guarded. Um, they're aware that there are people lurking and watching and listening um, in a way that um, isn't... Uh, that, that you're not aware of in the same way that you are in a face-to-face -face space. Um, what was really interesting was that a lot of postgraduate students used the MOOC space as a place to share postgraduate experiences. So um, one of our students reported, it may sound cheesy, but I felt far less alone to know that colleagues in science or whatever were facing similar challenges. I think a critical part of the wrapping process, the co-curricular wrapping process for us was building community. Even if they were transient communities, uh, six to eight weeks that people met together, um, that was really important for many of our students. Um, for many students, um, facilitators referred to sessions as kind of like group therapy. Um, the facilitators were almost holding a safe space, holding a space where students could bring concerns, bring challenges, um, into which they could interact with people who were facing similar things but perhaps coming from different spaces. And many students found it very, very comforting to realize that the problems that they were facing were faced by a very wide diversity of people. Um, and that was, for many of them, a very comforting experience to have. The next kind of key finding that we really wanted to highlight was, yes, that people learned things, specifically that people learned stuff. It wasn't, weirdly, necessarily always the stuff that the MOOC set out for people to learn. Um, sometimes they learned all sorts of other things from interacting with each other that was almost more valuable than necessarily the cognitive material, the learning outcomes for the MOOC. So what happened in a lot of the spaces was that MOOC assignments were, ad were adapted for the particular group in front of us. So MOOCs would sometimes set particular topics for writing or public speaking. And a lot of our postgraduate students would say, well, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to write about that. That's not relevant to me. And so they would rework the assignment and present it to the face-to-face the -face group. And many students found that that process of adapting the assessment activity to suit themselves really helped them to apply knowledge to their own research. And people reported doing things like winning poster presentations, um, altering the root of their thesis. There's a very angry supervisor out there somewhere, I'm sure. Um, and just having a better grasp, generally, of how to manage their projects for their disciplines and their personal lives. 
And so a lot of the stuff that people learned probably had quite a bit less to do with um, the um, a little bit less to do with the learning outcomes of the MOOC in question and a lot more to do with engaging with other postgraduates and, and moving towards those kind of graduate attributes. So the fourth thing that came through very clearly in terms of interviews with students was the idea that independent learning is very difficult. And while MOOCs attempt to create a sense of community around it, there does still very much need to be a, a learner commitment to it. And so thinking about it in terms of learner presence, the fact that this was a voluntary program, people could step in, step out, there was no, most facilitators allowed people to join the group or leave the group fairly freely without any kind of massive guilt or, or shame. Um, and so it really relied on students being intrinsically motivated. And many of the postgraduate students noted that actually engaging in a MOOC, learning through a MOOC, required a lot more self-motivation than normal undergraduate lectures. Um, even though there were facilitated sessions, dropouts from the MOOCs remained pretty high, um, partly related to, to workload, um, because people felt like they had other priorities at the time. Um, and I think that was, that was sometimes quite a difficult thing to manage. A lot of people started MOOCs and then found pathway through them that it actually really wasn't what they were looking for and they were able to just step out of it without accruing any massive costs. Um, Karen's got a question, are there comparative data available about that? Um, Karen, in relation to the formal RAC MOOCs. Okay, so the formal RAC MOOCs, the ones that are embedded in courses, the, the dropout rate would be, is related more to the formal course uh, to the face-to-face -face course rather than to the MOOC itself. Um, and so what might be quite interesting is to monitor online time versus face-to-face -face time. So um, the next substantial finding was the idea that in fact logistics substantially matter. Um, and the particular framework that we were using to look at the data, the community of inquiry framework, um, doesn't necessarily foreground what we chose to call structural factors, or what Tassim chose to call structural factors. Um, and she identified four factors that had a substantial impact on what students felt, um, what students' experience of MOOCs were. The first was largely related to kind of structure and format. Initially, when, when MOOCs were being released, there wasn't always a great deal of time between the MOOC content being released and the facilitated session happening. And so students really struggled to put um, time into that um, or to make the time for that on quite short um, timelines. Um, and that meant that they came to the facilitated session feeling a little bit underprepared, which reduced their enthusiasm for the session. We also found that in the face-to-face -face sessions, the venue, the actual shape of the venue, was really important to students. So a face-to-face -face session where for example, a computer lab was booked, which makes sense because you imagine people are dealing with online material. Many students had a fairly negative experience of that type of venue. They really were looking for kind of flat, small meeting rooms. Um, and they felt that led to better engagement, better interaction than a computer lab. The, a lot of students indicated that actually the sessions were too short. So we ran on sort of 45 to an hour sessions. Um, with some of the MOOCs opting for, some of the RAP MOOCs opting for two hours every two weeks. Um, but for the most part, students reported that that actually wasn't enough time to engage adequately with the material with their peers and a facilitator. And then there was a bit of a struggle around group size. Um, with attrition from some of the groups being quite big, at times students reduced, uh, groups reduced to a couple of people. And that really wasn't ideal for discussion. So the face-to-face, -face, the affordances of the face-to-face -face space are really related to a kind of sweet spot where there aren't too many people, so the people get lost, but there also aren't so few people that students feel like there isn't actually an interesting conversation to be had. So in conclusion then, 
Um, the facilitated sessions really provided a very meaningful experience to students in terms of addressing particular cognitive needs that they had identified for themselves. Um, that students still struggled with the independent learning. Um, without the disciplinary structures of a formal accredited course, sometimes the motivation to complete a course was difficult for students to find. Um, and then, really critically, the thing that came to the foreground for us was the, the social issues, the kind of being issues um, for postgraduate students, related particularly to a sense of are they prepared for, the, for their postgraduate study, are they part of a community working on their postgraduate work. Um, for many, many students, one of the strongest experiences that they report was feeling more actively part of a group. Um, yeah, so I think I'm going to pause there and see if there are any questions or thoughts that people would like to share. Um, maybe perhaps if you have any questions that are related, you know, that relate to your experience of taking MOOCs um, as well. Um, yeah, so questions from anyone? So I see Nicola's got a question. Do we blame the MOOC or the students for not being able to learn together online or with a physical group? That that is interesting. Um, so next, I'm not sure it's a I'm not sure it's a matter of blaming um, either. Um, I think the reality is is that for many students there are priorities and there are demands on your time, and if you are engaged in independent personal study that isn't directly related to your, isn't obviously and directly related to the study that you are being funded to do, it's quite difficult for um, students to maintain interest under pressure. So to continue that question, are MOOCs just too big to be effective? Um, is it a poor learning design for particular students, not a one size fits all? Um, Karen has a question around, do you feel we should accustom or teach students to and about the MOOC environment before asking them to participate in one? So I think it's probably a combination of those things. MOOCs have particular kinds, are designed with particular kinds of students in mind. Um, and the students who take them are not always the students that they imagine. Um, and sometimes those people seek out or require additional support. So I'm a serial MOOC registerer. I don't have another way of saying that. I register for many, many, many MOOCs. Um, I will usually lurk around in the first week or two and establish whether or not I like what's going on in the MOOC before I commit to it fully. And I think what happened in a lot of the co-curricular RAP sessions was that students went to a MOOC looking for a solution to a particular problem. So I'm going to speak from personal experience here rather than in relation directly to the research. Many students went to the MOOCs that I facilitated for looking for someone, looking for a way to, for example, improve their English, looking for a way to make their writing better because their supervisor or someone had told them that their writing was awful. Um, and that's the kind of thing that a MOOC can contribute to, but it cannot do it alone. So I don't think that it's not so much a size of one size, not so much a matter of one size fits all, and more a matter of some problems don't have a silver bullet. Um, and MOOCs are definitely part of the solution to certain problems, but they're unlikely to be able to solve the problem on their own. Um, Karen had a question about accustoming students to a MOOC environment before asking them to participate in one. So if you're going to use MOOCs as part of a formal wrap. If you are teaching a course and the MOOC is going to be part of the actual course design um, that students are going to be uh, examined, assessed on, and so on, then I think absolutely you have an, a, a complete responsibility to support students' engagement with that material in the same way that you're responsible for supporting their engagement with any material that you, you create on the course. 
So for me, um, I think if you are if you're doing a formal MOOC, yes, you should support students' engagement. I think in co-curricular wraps um, and the other two kinds of wraps, the sort of um, less formal ones, peer wraps and so on, there is less of a requirement around supporting engagement because there's less risk. Um, if a student doesn't enjoy it or drops out of it, there is much, much less risk to them than if they had the same experience with a formal course or with a formal wrap. So I'm looking back at some of the conversation in the chat and I see that Nicola and Ruth are having a conversation about what if the MOOC were designed into a course for everyone? Um, I think the idea of um, personalizing MOOCs or creating different tracks to a MOOC is really interesting, but it's also quite difficult to do. Um, but I think it's a really, really interesting question. Irene has a question about gender, who joins more, completes more, etc. So we had a fairly small group, and I would say, well, relatively small group. In terms of gender, we had quite a lot of female students participating. Um, in terms of completing the MOOC, there were definitely students who, who felt like they had to complete the MOOC. And I'm less convinced that that had to do with gender and more to do with students who are very um, object oriented. Um, yeah, so in some cases, uh, I would say that, so with the writing MOOCs, students who came to me, for example, from the sciences were very, very focused on doing all the different parts of the MOOC. They watched every single video, they did every single quiz, um, and they were less, they, they were determined to finish all the pieces of the puzzle. Um, whereas my humanities students in the writing MOOC were often a lot more selective about what they wanted to engage with and what they didn't. And I think that that might have something to do with a kind of disciplinary, a disciplinary background and being able to read what you need from the MOOC in particular ways. Um, I'm just looking at some of the questions. So co-curricular wraps are like an additional reading list or optional extra support. So one of the ways to think about co-curricular co wraps is as sitting next to or touching on the curriculum, um, but not formally assessed necessarily directly within the curriculum. So we had students who, for example, as I said earlier, picked up either a MOOC in, if they were going into postgrad in the sciences and the last time they did stats was first year and that was like five years ago. So they went back and they redid a stats course. Um, in other cases, people decided that, okay, they needed to learn how to program in a particular language and they weren't familiar with that. So they went back and did a MOOC on that. So I think what was quite interesting for me was that co-curricular wraps, the relationship of co-curricular wraps to formal educational structures is around the kind of purpose of supplementing learning opportunities. I hope that makes sense, Nicola. Um, so for me, that's different, radically. A, a formal wrap is where students get credit for doing a particular MOOC. So I know that there are some cases where um, half the course actually lives online um, in a MOOC and students participate in that and then they submit the assignments through that or to that and lecturers have access to it in those ways. So just to think about that distinction as well. I think the, the challenge with the term wrapped MOOCs is that people have been trying to use the idea of wrapping as if it's a single thing. And I think that what we would like to really emphasize is that there are very many, many, many different kinds of wrapping. Um, and they depend to a large extent on the purpose and the context that people are in. 
And so it's quite helpful to think about what kind of rap you're engaging in or what kind of rap you're proposing. So Nicola's trying to think of a metaphor for different wraps, um, saying that it's similar to a particular kind of practice at a university. So I would actually step away from that. I would say the point of this is to look for that this brings practices from outside the university in. And so trying to compare it to particular practices in the university is going to keep adding to a little bit of the confusion around the languaging of it. So I would step away from that a little bit um, and consider just thinking about different kinds of wraps and what they're trying to do and who's involved in them. Okay, so are there any other questions from anyone? So, um, I see that, thank you uh, for everybody in terms of your attendance at the session. I think I'm going to hand the mic back to Catherine now um, to close and to say thank you just from my side from everyone who's attended um, for the very, very interesting questions and to my hiding in the corner typing away co-presenter Tosneem who's been interacting with everybody in the chat space. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to hand the mic back to Catherine. Thanks very much, Shanali, for that very interesting presentation. And you've touched on many, many aspects. And as you mentioned, yes, thank you too, very much to Tasneem. Uh, who has been fielding uh, the questions in the text chat area. So you basically tag teamed this uh, presentation um, and covered everything really, really well. So any more questions that you would like to ask either Shanali or Tasneem, you are welcome to enter them into the text chat area now. And if you think of something after the event, which is also pretty uh, common. You think of something that you would have liked to have asked at the time, but then you feel that the event is closed, so where do you go to to continue this conversation? You are welcome to post something on the Facebook group page, um, which is here. If you would like to add another comment, another idea, or even ask a question, you are welcome to post it there. But thank you very much again, Shanali and Tasneem. This has been really, really interesting. And um, as Jakob mentioned at the start of the session, we have also been streaming this on a couple of live platforms. And as per usual, the recording will be made available subsequent to the meeting as well. So you can always go back and re-engage with these resources if you want to um, connect with the content again. Right, Nicola is also saying that you can share the image um, on Facebook as well. So yes, these resources will be available to you subsequent to this meeting. <laughs> right, Shanali, how do you wrap? I was just thinking while you were actually giving this presentation, this gives a whole new meaning to wrapping. And are you a rapper? <laughs> Right, so if there are no more questions that people would like to ask in the text chat area, uh, please feel free to sign up for the next webinar, which is going to be happening in two days' time, as I mentioned. So please peruse the Emerge Africa website, where you will have a look and see all the seminars that have been organized for this special series, MOOCs in Africa. So this was the very first one today. 
which kicked off the series. So please sign up for the one on Thursday. Have a look at all the subsequent ones that we have lined up over the next few weeks and sign up for those as well because this is making a really good resource relating to MOOCs and investigating it from all sorts of different angles. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, Nicola has just pasted the URL link where you can find out more information about the upcoming webinar series. Thanks, Nicola, for um, this little advert for the one coming up on Thursday, the 17th. Again, at the same time, 1 o'clock. That is 1 o'clock in South African time. So remember, if you are joining us from somewhere else, to check your local time. But it will be the same timing session as today with Sukena and Michael, both from UCT as well. And they will be exploring what happens when lecturers in Africa make MOOCs. What do they learn? How do their practices shift? And how can lecturers be supported to become more open? Great. Thanks for that advert, Nicola. So please do feel free to sign up for that. OK, Jakob is mentioning that Andrew Deacon will also be joining as well. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. And this concludes our webinar session. Thank you again once more to Shanali and Tasneem for the great presentation and for sharing this with us and for fielding all the questions so expertly. Thank you very much and this concludes the session and the recording will now be switched off. Thank you.